that have uh, been involved in our Bible study for uh, the book of Esther, I certainly hope that you have gained a lot of insight. This is a wonderful book. It's uh, a book that uh, certainly brings um, hope to the Jewish people, but it brings hope to you and to me to know that there is a sovereign God in heaven who watches over all. He's in control of every situation, even though God's name is not mentioned in the book of Esther. Uh, he is never more present than he is behind the scenes, working out all the details uh, for the good of the Jewish people and for the glory of Almighty God. If you will, on your outline, it'll be behind the first page. Let's look at verses 17 to the end of the chapter once again for this evening in this final study. In verse chapter 17 and following to the end of chapter 10, this was on the 13th day of the month of Adar. And on the 14th day of the month, they raised and made it a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews who were at Shushan assembled together on the 13th day as well as on the 14th. And on the 15th day of the month, they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore, the Jews of the villages who dwelt in the unwalled towns celebrated the 14th day of the month of Adar with gladness and feasting as a holiday and for sending presents to one another. And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters to all the Jews near and far who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to establish among them that they should celebrate yearly the 14th and the 15th days of the month of Adar as the days on which the Jews had rest from their enemies, as the month which was turned from sorrow to joy for them and from mourning to a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and joy, of sending presents to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews accepted the custom which they had begun as Mordecai had written to them because Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, uh, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to annihilate them and had cast pur, that is the lot, to consume them and destroy them. But when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letter that this wicked plot which Haman had devised against the Jews should return on his own head and that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows. So they called these days Purim after the name Pur. Therefore, because of all the words of this letter, what they had seen concerning this matter and what had happened to them, the Jews established and imposed it upon themselves and their descendants and all who would join them that without fail they should celebrate these two days every year according to the written instructions and according to the prescribed time. That these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city that these days of Purim should not fail to be observed among the Jews and that the memory of them should not perish among their descendants. Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihel, with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm the second letter about Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus with words of peace and truth. To confirm these days of Purim at their appointed time as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had prescribed for them and as they had decreed for themselves and their descendants concerning matters of their fasting and lamenting. So the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim, and it was written in the book. And King Ahasuerus imposed tribute on the land and on the islands of the sea. Now all the acts of his power and his might and the account of the greatness of Mordecai to which the king advanced him, are they not written in the books of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second to King Ahasuerus and was great among the Jews and well received by the multitude of his brethren, seeking the good of his people and speaking peace to all his countrymen. As we continue on tonight, I do want to go over in the entire outline as we close for this evening. In tonight's final study of Esther, we are reminded that we have a sovereign God who is in control. That is hugely important. It's one of the great themes of the book of Esther, that God is sovereign. What does sovereignty mean? That God is over all. God is in control. God can use whomever he chooses to use, even if it's an enemy rogue nation, God can use whomever he chooses to use in order to accomplish his will and his purposes in life. 
He will do it for our good. He will do it for his glory. His sovereignty, uh, the doctrine of sovereignty, God in control, his providential care is a great theme in the book of Esther. As we study the celebration of the victorious Jews, we learn that our God is a celebratory God and that he continues to care for his people during that time of potential annihilation, second paragraph. The book of Esther is a classic illustration of the anti-Semitism that's been a part of Jewish history since its very beginning. Studying the book of Esther, we've learned that anti-Semitism is a path that always leads to destruction, not of the Jews, but of the perpetrators. Roman numeral number one, let's look at the designation of Jewish feast. The only thing left after the anti-Semites finish their work is the new feast of celebration for the Jews. When Pharaoh let the Israelites go from Egypt, they had Passover, and they still celebrate Passover every year. After Antiochus Epiphanes, he was one of the ancient ones that, that went into the temple of the Jews and ate pork. It was absolutely an abomination to the Jewish people. So after Antiochus Epiphanes, they had Hanukkah that they celebrated, and they celebrated at Christmas time every year. When Hitler lost the war, Israel was recognized as a nation in 1948, and now they celebrate their independence each year. When Haman's treacherous act was foiled here in the book of Esther, a new feast was inaugurated by the Jews. It's the Feast of Purim. The Feast of Purim has to be understood in the significant history of the book of Esther. Anti-Semitism is based on the hatred of one group of people for the Jews. The key anti-Semite in the book of Esther was Haman. He hated Mordecai for not bowing down to him. And he transferred this hatred to include the whole of Mordecai's people, the Jews, and his plan was to annihilate the Jewish people. And, uh, but what happened was that he and his ten sons and all those that were going to annihilate the Jews with him were destroyed instead. And the physical salvation of the Jews had been wrought, and now it was time for the Jews to celebrate. Now, look what Hitler wanted to do to the Jews. Well, God foiled Hitler's plan. And so uh, God foiled the plan here of Haman. And so because of this great thing that took place, they celebrate, they have several, seven or eight different feast days that the Jews celebrate yearly. I mean, it's a part of the Jewish tradition. And it's, uh, it's very much uh, a part of, of their life. Notice at the bottom of page 2, the description of this feast. The Feast of Purim, it's, you, you pronounce that like P-O-O-R, Pur, Purim. The Feast of Purim is a picture of celebration. The day after the Jews had retaliated on their enemies, they rested and made that day one of feasting and gladness. Except for the Jews that were in the citadel or the Shushan, the palace, who had an extra day that they got to retaliate before they rested and feasted. Verse 19 says, Therefore the Jews of the villages who dwelt in the unwalled towns, they celebrated the 14th day of the month of Adar as a day of gladness and feasting, as a holiday and for sending presents to one another. Mordecai wrote about this celebration and sent letters to the Jews throughout all the provinces to establish this custom of feasting, this observation, verse 22 says, As the days on which the Jews had rest from their enemies as the month, which was turned from sorrow to joy for them and from mourning to a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and joy, of sending presents to one another and gifts to the poor. This was the month that all got turned around. Instead of being the victims, they became the victors. Instead of being the conquered, they became the conquerors. Instead of being annihilated, they became the liberated. Notice verse 27 and 8 tells us the Jews established and imposed it upon themselves and their descendants and all who should join them that without fail they should celebrate these two days every year according to the written instructions and according to the prescribed time 
that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city, that these days of Purim should not fail to be observed among the Jews, and that the memory of them should not perish among their descendants. The name of this feast came from the time when Haman cast lots, or Pur, to determine the day the Jews would be destroyed. The Feast of Purim is the reminder of the time lots were cast to destroy the Jewish people and the lot was turned back on the destroyer. The lots that were thrown for Israel's destruction ended up deciding the very time at which the new national celebration was set because they had been victorious. Sometime, the Feast of Purim is known as the Feast of Esther. In one of the non-canonical books called 2 Maccabees, it refers to the Feast of Purim as Mordecai's Day. Now let me say something about the non-canonical books. Those are books that the Catholics have in their Bible in what would be called the Apocrypha. We do not have those in our 66 books of the canon of Scripture. The early church fathers did not believe that those books met the criteria by which the Holy Spirit inspired them to be put into the holy writ of our canon of Scripture. So you've got various books uh, that they have that we don't have. Uh, some of them are historical in nature and uh, some various other things in there that uh, those uh, putting together the canonical books, the book of can the canon, uh, this is the whole canon of our Bible, 66 books, the canon of Scripture, and in this non-canonical book here called Second Maccabees, it does have a lot of Jewish history and things in that. But notice, um, in one of the non-canonical books called Second Maccabees, it refers to the Feast of Purim as Mordecai's Day. Purim commemorates the deliverance of God's people at the hand of Esther and Mordecai. Now, notice the dates of the Feast of Purim. Page 5, the Feast of Purim, it's the last feast of the year on the Jewish calendar. Remember, Jewish calendar is not like our English calendar. Okay, the, the Julian calendar is different. There it occurs on the 14th day of Adar, which corresponds to our late February or early March. It's one month to the day before the Feast of Passover. In Jerusalem today, Purim is celebrated on Adar 15, one day later than the rest of the world. This commemorates the fact that the Jews in ancient Persia and Shushan the palace did not resist from fighting their enemies until the following day. This is known in Israel today as Shushan Purim, reminding them of the extra work that was done by the Jews at the time. Sometimes today, the Jews in preparation for this Feast of Purim go through a time of fasting. Well, let's look at the details of their feast. The most prominent feature during the Feast of Purim is the reading of the scroll of Esther. The Jews have a handwritten scroll of the book of Esther, which they read in the evening service, and then again the next day during the morning synagogue service. The book of Esther is known as the Megla, the scroll in Hebrew. It is the best known of the five books of the Hebrew Bible, known as the scrolls. These scrolls are short, and each of the scroll is read on a different holiday. For example, the Song of Solomon is read at the Feast of Passover. The Book of Ruth is read on the Feast of Weeks. The Book of Ecclesiastes is read on the Feast of Tabernacles. And Esther is read on the Feast of Purim. During Purim, the divine command to blot out the name of Amalek is taken literally. When Haman's name is read from the scroll of Esther, it's met with a thunderous roar of clapping from the Jewish people. They not only clap, they stamp their feet and boo and make a grinding noise with special noisemakers called craggers. During the Sunday, yeah. wouldn't you love to do that on a Sunday morning when I'm preaching? <laughs> I shouldn't give you an idea. You might do it. <laughs> this Sunday we'll have craggers and booing. All right. During the celebration, notice some Jews write Haman's na name on the bottoms of their shoes. As they stamp their feet during the reading of the scroll, Haman's name is literally erased off the bottom of their shoes. Another tradition was known as beating Haman. It involved building an effigy of Haman, which was then uh, hung and burned. 
This tradition was abandoned during the Middle Ages when anti-Semitic slanders were leveled at the Jewish people that they were burning a figure of Jesus Christ on the cross. Before the reading of the scroll, it's customary to pass a plate in the synagogue in remembrance of the ancient time when each of the Israelite males brought one half shekel for the maintenance of the temple. Each of the worshipers placed a gift or silver coins or a silver dollar or half dollar on the plate. The donor then owns all the money, picks up the coins on the plate, but then immediately donates back to the plate, fulfilling the ancient command. This collection is usually given to help the poor because part of the celebration is to give gifts to the poor. They also send presents to one another and gifts to the poor. They take portions of food and delicacies to friend. This Purim tradition is continued today. The outward expression of joy involves sending a plate full of pastries or cake or fruit and nuts by the hand of a child to friends and relatives. It's customary to give gifts to at least two poor persons during Purim so they can enjoy the festival. What a marvelous way to celebrate, not only to consider your own joy, but also to look around for others who may not have anything to enjoy and give it to them. Purim is a time of special holiday foods. The most popular of these is Haman Tashin. These are delicious triangular pastries filled with poppy seeds of prune filling. Wow, I don't think I want to try those. Their name is derived from two German words, mom, which is poppy seed, and taschen, which is pockets. According to tradition, ham and taschen are often served for breakfast on the day of the Feast of Purim. Another festive dish the Jews eat is kreplach. Uh, it's a noodle-like triangular pieces of dough that are stuffed with chopped meat and minced onion, filling and served in a thick steaming soup. Eating these special holiday foods is a celebration of a time of gladness. Purim is one of the happiest holidays in the Jewish calendar because it was a time when God overturned sovereignty, providential care there, uh, the enemies of the Jews, and gave victory to his people. Now, what can you and I learn from all this this evening? We live in a world where apparently we're often defeated, but we know that in reality, we really are the victors. We live in a world where often we appear to be underdogs, but we know because we have read the end of the story that we are the upper dogs. We're God's people, we're kings and priests of his kingdom. The book of Esther is permeated with irony. Haman built the gallows for Mordecai, but Haman himself was hung on those gallows. Haman was trying to solidify his position in the kingdom, but his position was given instead to Mordecai. Haman tried to kill Mordecai's people, but he and all ten of Mordecai's sons and all of those who hated the Jews were killed instead. Haman tried to wipe out the worship of the true God, which prevented men from bowing to him. But instead, many of the people of the land became Jews. Because Esther chapter 8 verse 17 says, Because fear of the Jews fell upon them, speaking of the Jews' enemies. Going through the book of Esther, it's uncanny what irony there is in what was apparent and what was real. Sometimes you and I look at what is going on in the world. It seems quite apparent that something is very wrong, but that's not real. What's real is that God is on his throne. What's real is that God is in control. What's real is that while we can't always understand what he's up to, we are going to win. We are victors and we are conquerors in Jesus Christ. And the exciting thing for the Jewish people is that one day there's going to be the deliverance for them that's not just out of danger to their physical lives. There is coming a time when all Israel shall be saved. When is that? During the days of the tribulation. Thank you. Thank you, smart students. All right? There's coming a time when all Israel shall be saved. Now, does that mean that every single Israelite will be saved? No. But it means the ones that are saved when God turns back to his program to the Jewish people, and it will be during the days of the seven-year tribulation. One of the verses the people of Israel read from the Old Testament during the Feast of Purim is a verse that talks about their ultimate deliverance. It actually has in it the Hebrew word Emmanuel, which is the word for Jesus, meaning God with us. The salvation of the Jews will one day be accomplished in completeness. 
even it is even as it is being completely accomplished in the lives of many people today we have a wonderful future with the lord the book of esther is just another reminder that we have a great and sovereign god who is in control that's the, one of the main themes right there of the book of esther as he cared for his people during the time of potential annihilation he continues to care for his people today and he cares for us who are spiritual israel as well. Well, I hope that you have gained a great understanding of the book of Esther and to remember that uh, even though God's name is never mentioned, he's never more present than he is when he's behind the scenes moving the pawns on the chessboard of life. And that's what gives you and me pause this evening. That's what gives you and me purpose and meaning and peace to know that regardless, as the song says, for I know whate'er befalls me, Jesus doeth all things well. God is in control. And even though you and I may not always understand some of the things that are happening in life. I got into a discussion in the past few weeks with someone about death and dying and and uh, do we really have an appointed time or can that time come earlier than the day it was appointed for? And, uh, you know, there's some tough questions out there to try to reconcile with uh, what you and I as finite creatures, uh, what we can understand and what we are not really privileged to understand. And that's why I always love to refer back to Deuteronomy 29.29, 29, the secret things belong to God. But the things that he has revealed belong to us and to our children. Amen?